14. Certification of authenticity. Cork foot beds. Woven laces. What does it say? Very minimal. Care guide. Vegetable tan leather foot beds. Doesn't feel like a vegetable. This sneaker would have been easier to make 150 years ago. And apparently now, these can only be made in one fact- oh. And apparently now, these can only be made in one factory in the entire world. Uh, we'll look into that. A factory that has a reputation of being so precise and so observant that when I spoke to another shoemaker, he said he brought in one of his shoes to be copied, and they copied every single detail down to a single stitch with an incorrect tension that caused a slight barely noticeable crease in the leather. These are the Fight Classic Lows. Every photo on their site looks like this, so I'm copying it. And upon looking at these sneakers, you may notice some indescribable quality to them that feels like this photograph specifically, or like these. What you're looking at before you is a series of images that I collected online of vintage cleats, running shoes, and sneakers that all also feel like this photograph. They have a vintage warmth to them that these fight sneakers also have. What's interesting though, the brands that made those vintage running shoes, cleats, and sneakers now say it's impossible to perfectly remake those exact same things that they used to make. There's always something missing. They don't feel right. So why is that? That's our goal today, figure that out. And also, this is an obscenely high quality sneaker. One of the best in the world and the price reflects that a lot. So why the heck does it cost that much and what goes into it? Because if you look closely, you'll see this leather strip that Fight is famous for. The leather strip has a secret behind it and it hides how the shoe is made, which we do need to talk about if you're a shoe nerd because there's some things you should probably know. So with all of that, I would like to welcome you to the first episode in The World's Most Fantastic, a series where I will travel the world trying to find the highest quality, craziest made apparel items that I can possibly find anywhere. Part of the draw with these sneakers, by the way, is that, uh, that's a pretty bad shot. Part of the fun with these sneakers is that they age beautifully over time. So I've worn these for like two months or so, and I'll show you what they look like when I got them, what I look like when they worn them, then I clean them up and they look like this, but you'll see, you know, it's fun to see. So we'll do that throughout the video. Very important disclaimer, I paid for these 100% with my own money. These popped up on an Instagram ad and I thought they were the cat's meow. So I bought them and then I fought tooth and nail to get in contact, really, it's really hard to get in contact with Toll Price over at Fight, the founder of the brand. I only connected with Toll to get more information on this and to confirm things and make sure that I was right and not telling you the incorrect information. What's up guys, it's Michael, hope you're doing well. Sorry about the hair today. It's basically 1000% humidity and I'm drowning in the air. So it's like a fish's life. First thing that goes into these sneakers is basically cork. Both cork that looks like peanut butter and compressed cork. That is why comfort level, these sneakers feel like you're wearing Birkenstocks most of the time. We could do a whole video on cork because it's used to insulate missiles and spaceships and your feet, but that video is not today. So stay on topic. There's really only two ingredients that go into these sneakers. One of them is cork, like I mentioned. The other one is leather. There's also a lot of glue that we will talk about in a second and wax cotton threads here. But what about this leather? It's from Mariam Tannery, an Italian tannery that may also be pronounced Marine. I'm not positive. Tanning is the most important part of the process because it's where we take animal skin, which can rot and decompose and get gross over time and turn it into something stable that we know and love that also in this case smells very, very good leather. There's two major ways to do it. There is vegetable tanning, which is the original OG way of doing things with tannins from organic materials. A lot of times it's bark or acorns or leaves or a mix of all of that stuff. And the word tanning is used because we're using tannins from the organic materials to make animal skin into leather. And then, there's chrome tanning. Chrome tanning, instead of using tannins and organic things, uses chromium salts, which are very, very harsh, but they tan leather incredibly fast. That's why you see chrome tan leather everywhere. It has a lot of things that you might like about it too. It's very soft, more water resistant. It can take color on easier. The bad part is that it's not the best for the environment, especially compared to vegetable tanning, but vegetable tanning also has its own pros that are very fun and that you might like, and some negatives, but the pros are cool. If chrome tanning is really good at being water resistant, vegetable tanning is not as good, but it is far more breathable than chrome tan leather, so that's a plus. It's also generally, and I have to say generally because there's always ifs and buts and things like that, more durable, very, very tough. It's a harder leather, it's a, cre hold on. It's a very creaky leather, which you won't be able to, you can't hear it now, but listen to this. That's when I first got the shoes and the creaks went away after I treated them a little bit. Whoa, caught a leaf monster here, but it patinas absolutely stunningly, which is why I got these shoes and why I bet a lot of leather nerds get these shoes. But these shoes have another trick up their sleeve. This is not made of cap. This is made of horse. Oops. 
Microphone fell off. This is made of horse leather. We interrupt this program to bring you 60 seconds with Veyer. Here are six facts about the Chronograph R1. My name is Michael. You just watched like five minutes of me. Nice to see you again. Number one, the R1 Chronograph is assembled in a little tiny country I like to call the United States of America. Number two, the R1 is water resistant to 100 meters, actually 100 meters, and it comes with a two year waterproof guarantee from Veyer to back that up. You should back that up. Number three, this watch utilizes sapphire crystal, so you can't scratch the watch even if you tried, unless you have a sapphire knife or diamond knife. Four, this watch is a perfect size. Whether you are a big green giant or a tiny little rabbit, 38 millimeters is a fantastic size. Is that you, Tom Selleck? Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. You both look so great with that watch on. Number five, the R1 chronograph utilizes a mecha quartz movement, which is accurate to minus 10 seconds or plus 20 seconds per month. And number six, my favorite fact is the R1 is a chronograph, which is the best complication in watches. You can't argue with me because I can't hear you. Either way, though, thank you very much to Veyer for sponsoring this video. If you like this watch, check out the link in the description, and I will TTYL. Horse hide, unsurprisingly, got a lot more expensive after we stopped riding horses into town every single day, but it also has some really cool properties when you compare it to something like cowhide. It's a very dense leather. It's denser than cowhide and you can feel it. Everything feels tighter as in the grain structure of it all. So it does crease. It doesn't roll like cordovan wood, which doesn't crease at all and is very shiny and stuff. This is definitely a different leather than that. The point is that you can use a thinner leather that will break in very quickly and still have it be incredibly strong like a thicker cowhide would be. So you get the best of both worlds. The whole point of fight is that you wear these very naturally you're supposed to wear them without socks. They don't use metal in the tanning for that reason because it can irritate people's skin. It's more natural, it's more breathable. But by using a horse hide, you can get a lot of beautiful characteristics out of the leather and still retain a ton of insane strength while you can break in your shoes. Now the cool thing is that this is also completely built by hand. They don't use a single machine in the entire process. So how does that work? If you're a footwear nerd, you probably saw the $850 price tag and thought, whoa, that's very expensive, maybe a little too expensive, until I said these shoes are completely hand-lasted and hand-sewn. So what the heck is happening on the construction end? Quick rundown of how these shoes are made. Like I said, they're hand-lasted. A last is a little foot-shaped thing that is made of anything basically besides foot because you don't want to nail something into your foot to make a shoe. Machine lasting typically works like this. Last goes down, a machine goes and shapes the leather into the shape of the last. Hand lasting means instead of machine doing that, a person is yanking the leather or other material around the last, nailing it at the bottom, and then they put it in a steam room for like five days, and then it takes the shape of the last. Then what they do is they take this upper and they sew it onto the gemming. Gemming, not gemming. Of the insole. This is not Goodyear welt construction, which involves another strip of leather that goes around the shoe. Some people may actually like the welt to be there because say you can resole the welt twice and then you have to replace the welt once. That means you're only touching the important leather once for two resoles instead of twice. So your shoes may last a little bit longer. The rest of the process is actually very simple. So we have a little gap from that gemming. Gemming, not gemming. We fill that in with cork. Then we glue on another chunk of cork. Then we glue on this leather strip whose job is to hide all of that construction. Then we glue on a vegetable tanned leather outsole. Then we glue on Vibram pads. I'm saying glue a lot for a reason. These sneakers really use a lot of glue. Glue, as you probably know, is used very heavily in modern day sneaker production. We're going less and less the sewing route, more and more the glue route. People that pay $850 for sneakers though, may like more stitching because there's more points of failure instead of the glue coming undone. One stitch at a time might unravel if it's hand sewn, for example. These are obviously very functional sneakers. I wore them in the last video. I wear them every day. I love them. They're my favorite sneakers. Every time I put them on, I look at Taylor and I say, I love these shoes. Okay, let's go. But they also balance this minimalist art thing that they're going after more than like dress shoes or really heavy duty leather boots. So they use glue around the side seams here and certain other places. And that's not to say other brands don't use glue, but Fight does use a lot mainly to keep them still stylistically minimal. And finally, before we take all of this information and then we translate it into why new sneakers cannot look like old sneakers, we have to talk about the price. These are $850, like I said, expensive, but technically should cost $2,500 if they're made anywhere else besides where they are made, China. Oop, pause, wait a minute. We are going to revisit what I just said with other examples because uh, we'll just revisit it in a sec. This factory in China is kind of a unicorn of the world. I spoke to like five shoe and boot brands before I got in contact with Toll and they all said, oh yeah, this stuff is definitely made in this factory. And when I spoke to Toll about this and asked him about it, he said basically, one, he's not sure if there's even enough hand sewers in Italy to make these shoes. 
two, they would be stiffer and constructed differently, and three, they would start at $2,500 instead of $850 to be made. That's where I got the number, that's what he said. Welcome back, just got dinner. Plainly, this is always a very hot topic on this channel, so I just wanted to show you my homework so we're all on the same page with things. Fight doesn't really have an exact comp in the market, no one's making something super similar to them, so I'm showing you a bunch of boots and sneakers that have some similarities, some differences in the prices that go with those. When I spoke with Toll specifically about manufacturing and this fact, Factory, he said that after working in the footwear industry for decades, this is the only factory that could produce this shoe and hand-sewn footwear to his exact specifications and stiffness and everything like that. The only factory where things worked. All of that is to say that I now have confirmation that something similar to this can be made in the US, for example, that's where my contact that I asked was, for a similar price that is listed on the website right now, but that is not including the custom box, the extras that these come with, the custom small batch Vibram outsoles that they use, custom leathers, and all of those things. With all of that, Toll says if he's going to mimic that exact process in Italy, it will cost $2,500. You can make something similar in the US to this for what they retail for now, but it might not have the exact little nuances or specifications or something that Toll is looking for. I'm not saying these are overpriced or underpriced. Just want to give you context because sometimes this is a very hot topic. That is everything that I have and that I know, and I reached out to a few manufacturers to confirm. Either way, that is that. They make their latex shoes in Italy. I make my clothing in America. Goral, who shoes I'm wearing today, which I did. Ooh, I designed these, by the way. It's my first collaboration coming soon. They make their shoes in Sheffield, England. So with that, we finally return to the question: Why do vintage sneakers, cleats, and running shoes look different than modern ones, and why is it virtually impossible to recreate them one for one? In the 60s, 70s, when the running boom happened, all of a sudden we had Nike, Puma, Adidas, all racing to be the de facto running shoes. So they were all using very, very high quality materials from their inception. And those very high quality materials used early on, yes, certain things like foam on sneakers degraded over time and stuff like that, but the leather was a higher quality. So it creased different, it yellowed over time, it might have not disintegrated or flaked or chipped or something like that. So it had a different look to it. But also, at the same time, these were not the billion dollar brands that we know today. The sneaker game now is absolutely insane. We're doing fly knit stuff with Nike, I forget what Adidas calls theirs, On just debuted that 3D printed sneaker. It's insane. We have brands adding billions of dollars into their manufacturing, when in the old days, there was a lot more hands-on processes. And that is the key to everything, besides the materials aging. When you are a hand-lasting shoe, for example, not that that's what Nike was doing when they first debuted, the person doing that is making a ton of decisions. Should I pull the leather this tight? Do I need to do this workaround? That changes the way something looks at the end. Even if you can't notice it, there are certain things that are not perfect that are very attractive. Right, Taylor? What? If we look at it from a nerdy perspective, if you're machine lasting, you get a different characteristic which Nike has to account for. Machine lasting, when compared to hand lasting, has a very tight, slim, stretched look. So what does Nike do? They modify the material, the leather, so it can be a little thicker, have a little bit more life to it, a little bit more like bulbous characteristics to it, or they modify the last that it goes around to make it thicker and more bulbous and look more like it should. And all that is to say, those tiny little things that someone is not working on themselves and that Nike and big brands have to account for means your sneaker loses that sense of handmade warmth both from lesser quality materials being used but also the way it's interacted with when it's being made. Thank you very much for tuning in to the world's most fantastic. This job is a literal dream of mine and always has been, so thank you for that. And I will see you very soon. I'm going to go shave my head now.